You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, Carlos Stebbings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 190 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. My name's Neville Bounds, and uh, due to some technical challenges, we have a slightly different show uh, this week. And uh, joining me uh, from Bungie is Matt Smith. See, but I'm not in the kitchen studio. This is weird. I'm in my house. You can see my you see my beautifully adorned fridge behind me, which will have a New York magnet on it when I've retrieved it from uh, from everything else. So yes, so welcome to Bungie. Just a different part of Bungie. I'm in South End Road, as where uh, where, <laughs> where we are. And uh, yeah, this is um, this is a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, you must be very tired, having uh, flown through the night back from New York uh, this morning. Yeah, you think that, but um, actually, I have to confess, um, I've never slept on an aeroplane in my entire life, ever. And for some bizarre reason, I don't know whether it's because I was overly tired, but I, I basically got on the aeroplane. I, I had to move seats because um, we were right at the back. And, and uh, I know everybody tells me that you should always go to this seat guru thing. And any, anyway, we didn't for whatever reason. Mm. And the very back row on this particular aeroplane, I couldn't get my knees behind the seat. Um, which was a bit of an issue. So anyway, I was very lucky. So uh, uh, without uh, without really having to do anything, I, I accidentally got upgraded to uh, a premium economy. Oh, which was nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. more like it, that, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I went from no legroom to lots of legroom, which was an added bonus. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I sort of basically uh, got my seatbelt on, we took off, uh, and then I was awoken by the crew for breakfast, uh, so, I oh know, sorry, my evening meal. Sorry, I was awoken for my evening meal, consumed my evening meal, and uh, then was awoken again by the bright lights coming on. And apparently, it was now breakfast time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, so, you know, uh, that, that was it. And that, then I nodded off again shortly after that. And I felt a, a bit of a rough bump thinking, oh, blimey, that turbulence is a bit bad. And then realized we were on the ground. So, <laughs> so um, okay. I'm actually all right, funnily enough. I seem to have got enough sleep frankly yeah <laughs> I've never done it'll, it'll, it'll be I've... tomorrow when it all goes wrong i'm, I'm, I'm sure oh, yeah, uh, it's, but, not, it's but, like the shortest uh, flight i've ever been on ever because it yeah. was <laughs> like yeah. so, like the six hours just went whoosh gone oh, I bet. yeah excellent yes. well of course uh, carlos is in the dubai at the dubai air show and that's why he's not able to join us but he's in the chat room i notice uh, which is, is always he? good oh, but uh, <laughs> so he obviously he'll be criticizing uh, from oh, stage God. left as he does but yeah the reason we couldn't do a show yesterday unfortunately was that uh, Carlos's connection appeared to be really good from Dubai, but actually when we tried to stream it, it just was not playing at all. And then I tried to host it here, and within a minute of that happening, I had a power cut, which lasted for about an hour, which was uh, particularly yes. unhelpful. So it's one of those days where it was just never going to work. But yeah. we are also joined uh, in a, a venue unknown, because I don't know where he is, and that's <laughs> Owen. He doesn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm somewhere in Tenerife. No, I'm not in Tenerife. I yeah. was in Tenerife earlier. Um, no, I'm here back in Stansted. Hi guys, great to be back on the show, and thanks for having me. Yeah, great. And uh, did, you, did you have a nice time in New York as well, uh, Owen? Oh, it was absolutely fantastic. Had uh, a lovely ten day break there, um, and joined up with Matt. Got to see Nick a few times. Uh, was staying with David Abbey for a while, so thanks to all of those guys. Um, yeah, no, we, yeah. We, we, were, we were very lucky actually. We went to, um, we got to meet up with uh, Captain Nick, I think it was the Wednesday morning, wasn't it? Uh, before we went to go and set up for this show, and uh, he took us to what I can only describe, Nev, as what should become your spiritual mecca. If you were ever to have any kind of religion, this is where you need to base it. Because I, th I think I know where that is. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. There's this amazing place called the B&H, the B&H store. And in fact, actually, both me and Owen ended up buying little trinkets, didn't we, from, from said shop. Um, well, you have to well no absolutely you had to buy something, so bought something vaguely useful so i bought what i'm actually using now which is uh, something that nick advised to me this amazing little tiny little microphone uh which was scarily cheap 
But uh, I mean, seriously, yeah. I mean, I, I would recommend taking the company credit card in there, Nev, because you really would have. A, there were some stunning cameras in there. I, it was just amazing. Yeah, I've been past that place many times, but I've never actually been in, and that that might be a, a dangerous thing. But you never know right. one of these days. I mean, <laughs> yeah, just, it might have uh, been a conscious decision not to, just not to go in there. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what. If you could go in there without buying something, Nev, you're a better man than me. It was just. Is it, the best. Is it a bit like when you used to go to Staples or something like that? You used to go in for some uh, toner for your printer and you'd come out with an answer phone wouldn't you it's, it's one of those, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. One of those yeah. sort of places isn't it ikea yeah yeah oh listen Same to story. you gosh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> IKEA. how the other half live yeah no, just, yeah you, you go in for a, like a usb lead and come out with a with a fifteen thousand pound camera you know that yeah, sort of thing <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyway, as I say, it's going to be a slightly different show, a uh, slightly shorter show than normal today uh, due to a few technical challenges that we're going to have uh, later on in, in piecing it all together. But we're going to uh, give you uh, basically as much of the commercial news segment as we possibly can but, uh, between the three of us. Uh, we're going to have a Nev's passenger segment, which we can't play out live, unfortunately, but we'll uh, we'll introduce it and then it will be in the, in the final uh, podcast later on. So if uh, that's OK. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us in the chat room tonight uh, surprisingly full actually i'm very yes. proud of you all it doesn't <laughs> think, seem to, yes they, they think found after, us please. after last night's uh yes. fiasco i think they're just uh i think they're here, they're here, for, they're here to, to have a good laugh at our expense i think that's what yes, it is that's right yeah, <laughs> see so. what can go wrong but you see that, that isn't the case now you see because you you've, you've got the master back in charge now when it comes to the tech so there we are <laughs> all good he, said. he says modestly and it all rapidly falls off like that anyway. well there we are <laughs> yeah. Yeah. there we go should we do some aviation news nev Let's do that. So uh, if you're ready, Matt. Yes, I am. And if you're ready, Owen. Yes, I am. Let's go. Well, the first story is from theguardian.com, and uh, it says that uh, turbulence continues for Airbus as one of the uh, first A380s exits service. And uh, one of the first of these to take to the skies a decade ago will be taken out of service in a remote French airport next week as the manufacturer Airbus hopes for a major order to allay doubts over its super jumbo's long term future. An A380 launched by Singapore Airlines in 2007 will be parked at Tarbes Airport in the Pyrenees by its owner, a German leasing company. According to Bloomberg, the firm will rent out the plane's engines whilst it searches for an operator to take over from Singapore. Singapore, uh, Singapore Airlines, raising the possibility that an aircraft that costs $432 million straight off the production line could be scrapped. However, a much needed boost for the aircraft and Airbus could be imminent. The first major airline order in four years for an A380 is anticipated on Sunday after negotiations with the Emirates airline. Hopes are high at the Franco-German manufacturer at the start of the Dubai air show, which is where Carlos is. Uh, this will lead to the biggest purchase since the same line, uh, same airline ordered 50 a380s in 2013. The partly British-built plane was once the ultimate status symbol for airlines, as seen as the best production uh, model to fly uh, inc to increasingly congested major global airports. But its prospects have begun to look increasingly bleak, with Emirates uh, popping up, sorry, propping up sales, making by making 142 of all 317 A380 orders to date. Almost two years have elapsed since the Japanese airline ANA bought just three A380s. Predictions of the A380's demise have been made with increasing confidence since Airbus said in July that it would cut production again from 12 to 8 planes per year. Such an announcement will have stoked glee at rival manufacturing uh, Boeing. Uh, the story goes on a little bit, but basically it's quite interesting, isn't it? The uh, To imagine that this aircraft actually went into service in 2007 and now they're mothballing the, the first one ever made. So it'll be interesting see, to I, see uh, what very, happens there. Very, I mean, I, everybody that I, I've ever sort of come across who's who's got on one of these a380s have all said what an incredible like feat of engineering a beautiful aircraft really comfortable lots of space etc etc you know you can come the, the configurations they have inside and that are just just out of this world uh, it just uh, is it do you think it is just because of this whole four engine thing 
Well, the thing is, obviously, it costs more, doesn't it, to run four engines rather than two. And with all the ETOPS um, certification of, of these two engine aircraft across very long stretches of water now, um, you know, it, it is more efficient to run uh, a two engine uh, airplane. Of course, nothing quite has the capacity of the A380 in terms of actual passenger numbers. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I just wonder whether the A380 was a little bit too late maybe it should have come out a, a bit earlier possibly yeah uh, but you know you just five years earlier who knows who knows what people would have uh, yeah exactly made of it really yeah. actually glenn taylor in the chat room here is saying i love flying on the a380 just not with Qantas." so there's obviously a story there that uh, <laughs> next yeah. passenger experience needs to get out of him uh, <laughs> but i think there always will be a place for the a380 and mainly because just the the amount of slots that we have and the amount of space you have uh, in airports nowadays is, is getting a lot, lot smaller and it's getting a lot, lot tighter. Um, so you, in order for for people, for airlines to grow, you just physically have to put more bombs in the same aircraft, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's just the way it is. Um, so I think with major city pairings, I think there's always going to be that, um, I think there's always going to be that demand for it. So what? So what engine but size is it enough to keep it going? I don't know. So for, forgive the naivety here. So the A three fifty is that a four engine configuration as well, or is this two? No, the three hundred and fifty is a, a two engine, uh, very right. efficient uh, aircraft as well. So okay. it's all about fuel burn, really. That that's the, that, that I mean, seems to be what's the end of it. I was, yeah, I, 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 you, you can't blame the the airlines for being sort of focused on that, I suppose, because at the end of the day, they're they're the ones that have got to keep these things in the air, haven't they? And yeah. if, if they can do it with two engines and not burn as much fuel, then why wouldn't you? But it's such. Yeah. A, I suppose the other thing is with the two engine aircraft, there's a lot more flexibility on the ground because only, uh, I mean, there aren't that many air, major airports that can handle an A380 from the point of view of taxiing and the point of view of loading, unloading and, and that kind of stuff. There are quite yeah. a few, but obviously not as many as, as two engine uh, air, aircraft uh, stands. So uh, that, that may uh, have an effect as well, possibly. Ooh, oh, look here, Jenny. Jenny here is saying anyone in Stansted Airport tomorrow by any chance around lunchtime? Yes, ah, yes, yeah. I actually am. Whoa, oh dear, right, okay, you okay, two need Jenny, to talk after the show, absolutely. Get in touch. Yes, yes, actually, lots of photos, Very please, because we, we haven't had the pleasure yet, uh, but uh, anyway, that, we, we're going to move on to the next story, as I say, it's a beautiful aircraft, it's such a shame, really, that, um, I don't know, maybe if fuel prices come down and that, people will be, mm. interested. And they say, of course, the story does say that there, it might somebody might be about to actually literally get one for the first time in four years, or at least yeah. putting an order for one. Well, the next story is a Ryanair story, so it must be uh, over to you, Matt. That would be me, wouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. This is on the UK Business Insider.com website, and the headline is, Leaked Memo Shows Ryanair Intends to Hire More Pilots After the Rostering Disaster. So Ryanair is to increase the number of pilots it employs directly and hire more staff to respond to their queries as part of a new programme to improve its pilots management according to an internal memo seen by Reuters. Uh, the airline in September cancelled over 20,000 flights saying rostering problems had left it without enough standby pilots to operate without significant delays. The resulting wave of passenger outage outrage threatened to undo the success of its always getting better customer service drive. Europe's largest airline by passenger numbers has responded by uh, promising pilots improved pay and conditions which it says exceed those offered by rivals in the memo chief people officer eddie wilson wow that's an that's a very weird title chief people officer uh, is, is this a new position that they've just taken on because of said crisis uh, <laughs> said almost 20 of ryanair's 86 bases had voted for the pay deal as of friday however a number of bases including its largest hub at london stands that have rejected the offer some pilots have been using september's rostering issue to press for better conditions and the creation of a pan-european representative body uh, ryanair has long opposed recognizing unions ryanair Ryanair is in, uh, said in the memo on Friday that it would dramatically increase the number of pilots employed directly rather than by outside agencies. Over 180 first officers would be offered Ryanair contracts in November and 300 more offers would be made by December. It also said that it hired 1,040 new pilots this year with the newest entrants receiving the better pay terms and that it expected another 400 to join 
by March, bringing its crewing ratio to 11 pilots per aircraft from 10.5 by the time the busy European summer schedule begins. I won't read too much more into that, Stu, because it's all fairly straightforward. But, uh, I mean, I, I, we say this every time, though, don't we? It's just like you know, every airline at some point usually hits a bit of a bump. And let's be honest, um, this is – I know it's an inconvenience, but it's not like uh, the whole Monarch thing where suddenly Ryanair is going to go bust, is it? It's just a, a glitch, you know. Exactly. And I think, obviously, it is partially to do with the success of the airline as well. It gets yeah, to a, a certain uh, capacity. And, and the, obviously, the, there's flight time limitations for uh, cabin crew and for flight crew as well. So, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So, no, I think they'll be, um, it's just the remainder of this year. I think they've got the problem for, uh, but I think they'll be uh, back in business. Everything will be back to normal once, once they've sorted out that sort of changing it from, because I mean, I, I know, I know people, like, all right, not to do with aviation, but where people, their schedules changed from where you always used to do sort of like was it april to march uh, for your holiday because a lot of people used to do it conveniently along with the financial year didn't they just because yeah. it was neater and easier and of course now people are changing it to to go sort of you know january to december and, and that's really what's what's where they've caught the cold essentially isn't it yeah, definitely. but uh, yes anyway uh, on to the next story owen and the next story is uh, from the mirror.co.uk it says, uh, British Airways staff reveal how an airplane's evacuation slide actually works, and hopefully you'll never have to use one. Fingers crossed you'll never have to use one, I think, as well. It's something we all hear about during an airplane safety demonstration, but for most of us, hopefully it's something we'll ever, never have to actually use. The evacuation slide. While it's exceptionally rare that it would have to be deployed, every commercial aircraft is fitted with an inflatable slide should the, there be an emergency where customers need to get off the aircraft quickly and safely. Now, British Airways ground staff has given us a glimpse into exactly how the slide works in a new behind-the-scenes video where they deploy a Boeing 777-200 slide during a series of safety checks at London Gatwick. The Boeing 777-200 planes are fitted with eight slides for maximum safety and efficiency. And these are all checked almost on a daily basis by highly trained engineers to ensure that they work properly. To operate the slides, engineers open the do aircraft door in the automatic position, which automatically causes the inflatable to deploy. It's an impressive sight. Inflatables can be up to 14 meters or 46 feet long, and it, yet it just takes six seconds for it to roll out, inflate and be ready for passengers. A speed we imagine comes in handy during an emergency. In the clip, British Airways licensed engineer Peter Dwyer uh, explains that to activate the slide, cabin crew need to put the door to automatic and pull the door handle to 180 degrees, at which point an assist system will take over. <laughs> he explains. The expanded, it'll fire the squib, the nitrogen pressure in the bottle uh, will power the open the door and a slide pack will fall off and the slide will inflate in six seconds. Oh, and if you've ever heard cabin crew being asked to cross check a door, there's a simple explanation. Doors need to be set to automatic or manual prior to takeoff and landing so that they're ready for an emergency. So cabin crew need to make sure they're in the correct position. Oh. That's uh, that's something you you probably will hear um, if you're flying. Uh, I, cabin crews doors to automatic, arm and cross check, or uh, in in my case, you won't actually hear that command, but um, it, you will hear the captain say when we get into stand, cabin crew disarm, uh, slides and open doors. Yeah, so it's um. Ah, see, see, we see uh, on on the flight I've just done. Actually, we we had um we heard the whole uh uh thing about um so sort of I've ne I've never heard those messages before, and that, and and that was the first time I'd heard them mention the word. Uh, they didn't say disarm. What was the other thing that they were saying? They they used a different phrase. It was sort of uh, like prepare cabin for for like you know boarding or unboarding or whatever it is it was uh... yeah so it, it, like ones that i've heard quite frequently are doors to automatic uh which would be the the arming of the slide and then doors to manual which is disarming of the slide. ah that's it yeah yeah doors <laughs> so in yeah. certain aircraft it'll be that or in, i uh, think you know we're always talking about BA and, and their need to improve their, their image. I reckon what they, they should do is they should take a plane that they're not going to use anymore, take it somewhere where lots of kids go, and then just open 
all of the slides because <laughs> I mean that would just be I, I'd want to go I've always wanted to have a go not necessarily in an emergency because I've got to get out of the aircraft fast but they just look so cool <laughs> they, they do uh, and I mean there's there's you know you can have the odd uh, twisted ankle and, and the odd injury there as well because it's a bit of a jump uh, from the aircraft itself onto the slide and obviously yeah. it depends on the people at the bottom getting out of the way quickly as well otherwise right uh, yes I know, a, but, a pile up there, but uh, yeah, no, but you see, I, as I say, you go go put it on some big field somewhere near. It's like you know, go go and land it somewhere. If you've got an, an open day or something like that, there's there's mm. got to be some fun had there, surely. I just like, yeah. I mean, the cost though to if if you are going to fly it out again, the cost to put these to replace these is absolutely monstrous. Yeah, you see, you just have to come out with the sensible thing of why it can't be yeah. done, Owen. I mean, that's just no, <laughs> that's just no fun. We're pish posh to the cost involved. Well, it's I've actually about... done it. I've jumped out uh, onto one of these slides in training, and um, it it's fun the first once or twice, and then after that you start going, ooh, I'm a little bit scared now that I'm going to get <laughs> the carpet things <laughs> down my arms and that sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah, Matthew Bunting, friend, he's saying friction burn is another thing you have to watch out for with yeah. these slides as well. Mm. Yeah, big time. Big yeah. Time. A lot of uh, people in the training course started to get friction burns in their fingers or oh. on, their, yeah, on the, their heels or stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Cap Cap the, the legend that is Captain Rick Bell as well. He's saying slide and door training is always a fun day when we go training, I bet. Yeah. It's a, do you have to do it regularly or is it just like a one off thing? um in my case we have to do it once every three years okay right so every well, three years so every three years you get to go and have a go of one of these slides <laughs> i it's more often than that in reality oh, i mean I like i have to open a door i have to be checked on how i'm opening a door every right. year Okay. Um, and generally speaking, we'll do a bit of the slide training as well. Yeah, you see, see, Rick, see Rick saying is they have to do it once a year as well. You see, so that's just just yeah. not. I'm very we jealous. We actually only have to jump down the slide once every three years. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. You know, but having to and actually doing it because you fell out of the aircraft, you know, the two. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe a possibility for the three hundredth episode. You know, PT oh, yeah. goes, goes down the slide. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, come on. There's. Don't tell. Now, come on, chat room. Tell me that you wouldn't pay money to watch me falling out of an aircraft <laughs> down one of those slides. That's got to be worth the spot. <laughs> Oh, dear. Shall we move on before we yes. all get arrested? Go on. <laughs> uh, so this is from the Daily Post website. And back to the uh, A380 story again, because Airbus reveals new double-decker jumbo plan, which could get passengers on and off planes quicker. Ooh. And the aerospace giant has submitted a patent which could speed up turnaround times and provide greater flexibility between passengers and cargo. Uh, the pioneering aerospace giant said it was trying to react to airlines continuously de uh, demand planes that um, maximize revenue whilst reducing operational costs. The, this has seen uh, them submit a patent for a jumbo jet that includes embarking and disembarking via equipment incorporated in the airplane to speed up the process of getting passengers on and off the aircraft. It would also include an adjustable partition wall and foldable seats that would mean airlines could ch uh, change the dimensions of the deck to cater for the needs of the flight. In the patent application to the United States Patent Office, Airbus states it is an object. Um, it is an object of the present in invention to provide an airplane that facilitates passenger embarking and disembarking and cargo loading and unloading operations in order to maximize the number of flight missions carried out in a given time. It's another object of the patent invention to provide an airplane whose internal space can be distributed in a flexible manner between passenger and cargo compartments. It adds the lower deck is located at a height from the ground that allows carrying out passenger embarking and disembarking autonomously without any specific airport ground equipment. Passenger and or cargo compartments are distributed throughout the upper and or lower decks. In an embodiment, the passenger and cargo compartments are separated by at least a movable partition wall. And advantageously, the airplane comprises one passenger compartment and a ca cargo compartment whose dimensions can be adjusted uh, to the airline needs by moving the partition wall. 
Foldable seats installed on guides in a sliding manner may be used to increase or reduce the dimension of the passenger compartment. The current double-decker, the Airbus A380, has struggled for orders in recent years, casting doubt over its future. But there are reports that Emirates are lining up a bid for dozens of A380s at the Dubai Air Show this week. Well, we've just talked about that, and obviously Carlos yeah. is there as well. But uh, this is, of course, one of the biggest problems, isn't it? Actually getting people on and off the aircraft. And it does, um, when I have come back from Fuerteventura uh, last week on uh, just an, an A320, it seemed to take ages to, to get the aircraft boarded. I mean, yeah. you start talking about uh, aircraft of this sort of size, so people need to look at uh, new and innovative ways of trying to uh, get people on and off the, the aircraft as, as well, I think. I think that was one of the... Oh, sorry. Go, Go on. on. No, you carry on. Sorry, that was... That, was that was something that I found really interesting when I was flying the the transatlantic flights. In that we started boarding, um, we started boarding those flights forty five minutes to an hour before the flight was scheduled to take off. That's three times. Well, twice to three times longer than my my turnarounds in total are. Mm. Yeah. That's true. That I mean, I, one of the things that I, of course, because I've only ever done like what, like short haul flights and stuff, uh, and of course, like the this time, and obviously when I went to Pittsburgh, it's the first time, obviously, that I've got on using what I call like the air bridge thing. So I'd never really experienced that before. But actually, that does. I think that's one of the reasons that that really slows it all down because, because you're you're all going in through one door, as where for you know if you're using one of the lower cost airlines and you've got basically air stairs either side of course you are loading from two sides of the aircraft you're, you're from two ends of the aircraft so by sheer definition that should mean that you're loading faster i think the other problem is as well is people um i mean not that i would dream of criticizing passengers of course but um, <gasps> uh, on on my aircraft the other day <laughs> whoa <laughs> steady brace yourselves everyone you've, you've got people <laughs> who um uh, have gone all the way down the end of the aircraft thinking that they're on seat 29 or something yeah. or row 29 and actually they find out they're on row seven so they're now right. coming back uh to the forward to the front of the aircraft whilst everybody else is boarding, boarding. So that's not that helpful, really. No, um, those sorts cool. of things in, increase loading times. But it'd be interesting to see if uh, Airbus um, come up with, with an alternative arrangement for, for boarding these yeah, large aircraft. Absolutely. So, yeah. this, this, yeah, this, especially this, a thing of the size of an A380. I mean, yeah. those things are certified up to 800 and ridiculous passengers. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, could you yeah. imagine trying to help them with those? So on to the next story then, and uh, that's uh, you, Matt, I believe. It is indeed. Actually, just before I move on to this mm. next story, can I just say thank you very much to everyone who's watching today because this was such a last-minute <coughs> sort of desperately trying to get everything all out type thing, and the chat room is absolutely rammed. So thank you very much for uh, our very loyal listeners joining us while we're while we're doing today's show because it's, uh, it's made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Oh. Uh, anyway, I oh know. I'm feeling a bit emotional. I'm now tired. Uh, <laughs> so that's so anyway, this is the uh, telegraph.co.uk and the headline is Flyby airliner crash lands in Belfast with no nose gear, which is slightly unfortunate. So uh, an airliner has landed with no nose gear at Belfast International Airport. 56 people were on board the Flyby flight uh, BE331 when it was forced to carry out an emergency landing with the front of the plane unsupported. The bomb, uh, he, the Bombardier uh -huh. Q400 <laughs> had taken off from Belfast City Airport and was due to fly into Inverness before being diverted. The plane burned fuel in a holding pattern off the coast of Belfast for around two hours before landing at Belfast. Belfast International Airport with the runway closed to other aircraft. A Flybe spokeswoman said Flybe can confirm that there has been an incident involving one of our Bombardier Q400 aircraft, Flight uh, Bravo Echo 331, which landed with no nose gear in place. The aircraft departed from Belfast City at 11.07 a.m. bound for Inverness. The incident occurred at Belfast International Airport at approximately 1.30 uh, p.m. There are 52 passengers on board of four crew members. Our primary concern uh, is for the welfare of the passengers and crew. A spokeswoman for Belfast International Airport said that a flyby flight from Belfast to Inverness declared an emergency and landed at Alva Gove around 1.20 today. The airport is still open and full emergency procedures have been deployed and the one thing that they don't make clear here is um why there was no nose clear 
So well, w- w- was a faulty nose gear the reason why the aircraft was diverted and sent to, to Belfast? Or? Yes. I mean, this aircraft does not have a great record in terms of landing gear uh, because right. uh, normally it's been one of the main landing gear that's collapsed. And in fact, uh, Scandinav- uh, Sc- Scandinavian Airlines, SAS actually returned a load of aircraft back to bomb- uh, Bombardier because of the oh, yeah. um, uh, of, of these faults. So I think this is, might be a bit of a one-off thing, really. But uh, right. I think the crew did a nice job. Uh, by the, by the looks of it, and, yeah, um, yeah, no, it's yeah, pretty so good. I mean, I'm nobody's sure hurt. Again soon, so yeah, yeah I mean, it's nobody's like hurt. an airplane. Uh, the, yeah. the, the aircraft still looks like an airplane. There's no, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it is surprising how much they can do by keeping the nose in the air. I mean, that balance to make sure it doesn't sort of work. Well, I don't suppose it can flip that flip over because of what's at the back of the aircraft, you know, with the with the fins and stuff. But uh, you know, I suppose you've got to get as much speed off as you can before you drop that nose wheel um, into the, uh, you know, sort of onto the tarmac, I guess, to minimise the. Uh, yeah, you can't drop it off. It too much because then you'll stall the aircraft and the nose will go down even harder really hard yeah absolutely yeah, so it's a really fine balance so yeah fair juice to the crew but if it landed well, at uh, aldergrove um in belfast that's a decent length runway so plenty of runway it certainly to, is uh, yeah, yeah absolutely that's a fair point yeah so, but, that uh, is true okay there we go um so uh, owen uh, you have got the next story sir i've got the next one and this one is from the philadelphia.cbslocal.com this flying hotel could be yours for just seventy four thousand dollars an hour lovely cheap <laughs> <laughs> i think so um if you've ever wished you didn't have to leave the comfort of a high-end hotel to fly around the world you're in luck dreamjet is a part air- airplane part luxury apartment and for only five thousand or 500,000 Chinese won, or about uh, $74,000 an hour, it's available for charter. This heavily mo- modified VVIP jetliner, that's very, very important person, is based on Boeing's advanced 787 Dreamliner. That's also where the Dreamjet gets its name. Even under the rapid expansion of business aviation in China, or even though... The rapid expansion of business aviation in China has cooled under political pressures. The jet's operator, China's Dear Jet, uh, a unit of fast-growing conglomerate HNA Group, is expanding its portfolio outside of the country. HNA Group recently bought a 25% stake in Hilton and is using the VVIP 787 to extend its hotel brands. This Deerjet unit and the Waldorf Astoria and St. Regis hotels have partnered to use the 787 to fly the well heeled from Hong Kong on some trips to Rome, Paris, and Tahiti. During a recent visit to Seattle, Deerjet opened its doors for a rare look inside the converted jetliner. H&A Group CEO Adam Tan has flown in the night before from Doha aboard the jet for a meeting with Microsoft founder Bill Gates. <laughs> it's really like your home, said Tan. It's probably not like your home, nor is it like any other ordinary jet glider. <laughs> the entryway bears no resemblance to the typical flying experience, save a green exit sign. You slip off your shoes and enter a circular foyer. One route off the foyer leaves down a narrow hallway to the cockpit, one to an expansive sitting lounge, and yet another takes you to the master suite. Wood panel walls run along the wide hallway to the main sitting area, outfitted with 19-inch tall windows, lounge, seat, lounge seating and coffee tables. Top of glass sculptures from the, frame, uh, the famed artist Dale uh, Chihuly. A white linen tablecloth covers a pair of expanding dining room tables so that each seat up to six. There's no gold plating or it's or flash. It's luxurious without being gaudy. The master bedroom, however, is a fit for royalty, complete with a California king size bed and a forty inch, uh, forty two inch TV. The ensuite bathroom has a double vanity and an enormous white tiled shower with sixty minutes worth of hot water. The bedroom was designed with the extensive soundproofing, enough to keep the sound at 44 decibels during cruise, roughly the volume of a quiet suburb with traffic, with light traffic. Wow, I mean, this is just insane. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on with more and more unbelievable, um, with more and more unbelievable 
features that this this jet has. But uh, it, it well, if you, <laughs> if you have seventy four thousand dollars an hour to spare, why not? Well, I, you know, I mean, well, you could argue if you have got that kind of money kicking around, maybe there are better things you could spend your money on. Um, I mean, uh... I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! Well, to be honest with you, if I had that kind of money, I, I'd be taking myself to B and H in New York immediately, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, buying some uh, Nick recommended items. Frankly, but <laughs> yeah, no, I agree absolutely, absolutely right. But uh, well, this is a story about uh, the Dubai Air Show, which is where Carlos yeah. is at the moment, and he's been getting some awesome interviews. We understand, yeah. so that we're going to look forward to playing those out uh, later on. But this is. Um, from Aviation Week, and it says that Dubai Air Show just gets bigger. The naysayers may be warning visitors not to expect the multi billion dollar airline orders that Dubai's International Air Show has become accustomed to, but this is still going to be the biggest and best ever event since it all started in July 1989. Yeah. We're looking forward to an exciting and successful uh, Dubai Air Show 2017, uh, says the managing director of show organizers at Tarsus F&E LLC Middle East. The Dubai Air Show truly represents the center of the aerospace industry, and we are pleased to welcome the industry's key players from around the globe. If the dollars don't stack up, the exhibitors certainly do. There are 1,200 here from all corners of the globe and all sectors of the aerospace industry, while some 72,500, no less, diverse trade visitors are expected during the five business days. Nearly a third of exhibitors are from Europe and 40% from the Middle East, plus many from further afield. In addition, around 10% of exhibitors hail from the Americas. New attractions this year are, are the feature pavilions and conferences. The space conference and pavilion with speakers, including um, Apollo 15 command module, pilot uh, Colonel at Colonel Al Warden, uh, the cargo zone, the UAS summit and the airport solutions, which has been relaunched as part of the airport solutions global series. Having proved popular at three previous shows, the Gulf aviation training event is back but expanded to include panel discussions on maintenance and crew training, in addition to pilot training. Futures Day, aimed at inspiring the next generation of aerospace professionals, will also return on the final day on Thursday in conjunction with UAE universities. Dubai has drawn in 100 first-time exhibitors also for the air show. Um, but remember when Carlos said to me, it's a big air show, I did not realize how big yeah. the thing was. And with 72,500 visitors, that is wow. incredible, isn't it? Absolutely. But also, I mean, and it's very difficult to get in as well. I mean, mm. I, I, he's, he's, done, he's done well, really, to get yeah. get a pass. I mean, it's just, uh, I, can't, I can't wait. I, I've told him he's got to take as much uh, video as humanly possible. I'm, I'm, I'm so looking forward to, to viewing all the content when, when he comes back, to be honest. Yeah, yes. looks, looks great. Yeah. No, so, um, but uh, and I've been seeing, and you might have seen as well, Matt, um, the uh, all the press releases that have been coming out from yes. there, uh, this week. There's just dozens and dozens just, every it's... every day. Phenomenal. Uh, I mean, I thought I, th I thought that like um, you know Farnborough and that kind of, and and Riyadh, not so much Riyadh, but especially Farnborough and that. I mean, I thought that was you know off the chart type thing. But as you yeah. say, since uh, since we've sort of officially been recognised by the Dubai Air Show as a as a media organisation. Honestly, these, the, the, as you say, it's just the, the emails that are coming. They make fascinating reading. They really yeah. do. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah. anyway, uh, so moving on, uh, the next story is uh, yours, Matt. Right. Okay. Yes, this is on the Reuters website. And the headline is Emirates may order 36 uh, to 38 Airbus A380s, uh, as per what we were talking about before. So this is this is exciting news, really, for them. Uh, you know, an, air, an, airline, an airline that we were listening to earlier where they thought it could yeah. be the end. Um, and uh, here we are. So this is in Dubai again. So probably Carlos will tell us all about it next week. Uh, Dubai's uh, Emirates may place an order for at the Dubai Air Show for between 36 and 38 Airbus A380 super jumbo jets worth some $16 billion at list prices. A, a person familiar with the matter told Reuters on Saturday. Uh, Emirates and Airbus both declined to comment. The order is expected to be one of the highlights of the air, sh uh, air show event. Um, 
at which Gulf carriers minus uh, Qatar Airways, uh, which is absent due to a rift between Arab nations, are expected to put a brave face on fragile business confidence in the region. It comes as Airbus and Boeing chase deals to prop up recently softening demand for wide-body passenger jets. Air Emirates, Emirates sorry, is by far the largest buyer of the world's largest uh, passenger jet, the A380, with 142 on order and 100 already delivered. The 544, they see that, those numbers frighten me. And I know Owen said like they can take nearly up to 800 or something stupid. But the 544 seat jet, that's just, that's just so huge. <laughs> Entered service amid huge fanfare in 2007, but its future has been thrown into doubt by sluggish sales as airlines turn to efficient smaller jets like the Boeing 777, of which Emirates is also its largest buyer. An A380 sale would bring respite to Airbus, which, Airbus, which has fallen behind at rival Boeing this year with 35% of their combined new orders uh, I, there, there is more to this story but I, I sort of won't go on really so it, you know it it does sound like it could not necessarily be the end of the a380 if, if these orders go through i mean it's a beautiful aircraft there's no two ways about that i'd love to go on one i still haven't been on one yet I'm have, you, have you have you uh, the ba do have one don't they they have lots yes oh do they and, right. uh, okay. but uh, yeah i'm trying i'm trying to find a nice long route to, to go on uh, right but, uh, okay. yeah so yes yeah, I, uh, do I you think you could... one as well do you think do you think you could persuade Mrs. Nev to go on a long distance somewhere exotic? Yes, I think um, out of all the places we've mentioned so far, I think Canada might be uh, oh yeah quite a good place to go. And we know a few yeah. people there, don't we? So we do. um, yes, absolutely. But, uh, yeah. So if there's any cheap overnight accommodation, maybe. Uh, so we'll see. How actually, we Richard Bell is asking the chat room here a great question here. Uh, what what does everybody think about this? And obviously, we throw this out to the chat room as well. Uh, do you think that we'll ever see a one thousand seat aircraft? Mm, I, th I, th I think it's definitely possible, especially, in fact, not necessarily on, on the longer routes that you might think, you know, the North Atlantic routes and, yeah. and, and Pacific, but but maybe for the shorter routes, especially in yeah. China and Japan and these sorts of things where they're transporting vast numbers of people mm. um, around. And um, I mean, look, look at the 400 uh, D model in of the 747. That was a fantastic model that was uh, used in only japan and it was used only domestically mm. and it was basically pretty much uh, maxed out in terms of how many passengers you could put on it yeah. would they fill those things as often as a harp jet fills our aircraft and well yeah. you know doing just as many flights uh, a, a good point by Jenny Parkinson, though, though, it's like we were talking earlier about how long it takes to board these things. I mean, is this one of these things where it's going to take two days to board if you've got to get a thousand passengers uh, on board? Good point. I think you might perhaps put, have put up on those sort of um, travelator things, you know, that you see in the airport. Oh, yeah, no, that's the way for Bundle people on, you know, <laughs> in the same uh, way. That's they do not a bad idea. I think yeah. you might be on to something there. Well, yeah, you know, I'm, moving I'm, floor. I'm just noting that as a pattern right now. Um, okay, so. very good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Julie noted. Julie noted. <laughs> But actually, Lane Street was saying he reckons he, that they probably won't see one in, in, in his lifetime. Mm. Um, but I don't know. What we, I mean, if you think we're up to 800, that's only 200 more. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's not far off. But um, do, do you think you might, maybe with, with what we know about engines and aircraft and all that, maybe, the, the, maybe that 800 is that, you know, with, with any kind of a, a advancement in technology and things, it always, you know, you get a really fast sort of surge in, in upgrades and changes and improvements and improvements. And then you sort of plateau, don't you, at a certain point where you, you reach a certain area and, and, and you sort of find it difficult to make things move faster. I mean, I, I remember back in the day, you know, you, you go back sort of 10 years where the speed of PCs and how much faster you could make them go was changing like almost monthly. You know, there was a new chip that came out that enabled you to go that little tiny bit faster. But mm. nowadays, actually, uh, machines are lasting longer because they're not, you know, they've, they've reached, they've sort of plateaued a bit really um, yeah. in regard. So they, they last a lot longer now because the technology isn't changing quite so fast. I mean, I, is that the same with aviation? Uh, I don't know if it is, but I, I, I would imagine technology being technology that it is. Um, but I think there are more than that. There's just a few major problems. And I don't know if the actual structural engineering is one. I think it's more going to be a case of, well, how well does the current infrastructure that we have in airports uh, mm. 
or how well will it be able to hold up to in a thousand person aircraft yeah um also if you go back into the chat room graham uh, has really really hit on uh, uh, on something i think yeah. is quite a big problem it being the development cost i mean look at the amount of time it's taken for um the airbus a380 to even recruit development costs let alone its whole production uh, life costs and uh, you you'll see that just making a thousand person plane you really have to be careful about who makes it and who orders it and also actually again graham haley you're saying in here like the the actual airport size because obviously you're going to need a larger wingspans uh and, and again lane is saying the same thing you're going to require a larger wingspan so the airports are going to have to be completely reconfigured to be able mm. to take those much larger aircraft and just yeah. imagine waiting at the baggage carousel oh, for your yeah. bags with the other 999 people. Oh, like, yeah. I, I can't wait for that. That'll be nice. Yes. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't have such a great experience going over to York waiting for uh, uh, my bag coming off a flight that just had um, maybe just over 200 people. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. They, 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 they left yours in, in Dublin, which was nice, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they left yeah. mine in Dublin. Oh, yeah, wow. absolutely. But you did get some new clothes out of it, so it could be worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it still has to be approved, but they've been sent in. So. Okay, right. You've sent the bills. We'll yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. So, uh, right, moving on then. And uh, I think Owen uh, is uh, got the next story. Yes. So this is uh, about a uh, Boeing 727. It's from the Daily Star at Cola UK. What a fantastic... Uh, news <laughs> gathering organization. The Daily Star. The wow. Daily Star. Got one I'll, down for the Daily Star. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. One down, about five down, mate. Please. <laughs> uh, there's, I'll tell you what. There's no way that I'm putting any pictures of, of the Daily off the Daily Star up on it. There's no way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it says disused Boeing 727 jet d hidden deep in the woods has an unbelievable secret on board. And uh, for anyone who's listening, unbelievable is spelt in all caps. Oh, uh, shouting, shouting. shouting. <laughs> a disused Boeing 727 passenger jet hidden in the deep of the forests of Oregon, US, has been has left viewers astonished after its incredible secret was revealed. Ooh. Owner Bruce Campbell opened the plane's doors to the media for the first time, showing its jaw-dropping transformation from passenger jet to cozy home. Uh -oh. Stunning footage takes viewers around the inside of the giant aircraft, which has been stripped of nearly all its passenger seats to make way for more homely appliances. The tour shows off the plane's unique kitchen and living area, even showing a working bathroom complete with a shower. Bruce began living in the converted plane in 1999, but now splits his time between Oregon and Japan, leaving uh, his beloved behind for half the year. I've spent roughly 40% of my time in Japan since 2009, leaving my 727 in the hands of trusted friends, he explained. I savoured the company of loved ones and cherished friends there, and enjoy the very charming and rewarding recreation, including lots of exhilarating tennis and mini volleyball, but there's more on my agenda to do. The talented engineer claims he's working on plans to replicate this incredible achievement in Japan. He continued, I'm, I'm attempting to establish uh, enough traction to execute a Boeing 747-400 home near Miyazaki, in, uh, Miyazaki City in Japan. The hurdles are enormous enough uh, are enormous even though some logistics for sitting an intact wide-body aircraft on a private land look favorable. Bruce explained how he continues to make improvements and adjustments to his spectacular home, adding, money is less uh, constraining matter lately, but I'll, our money is a less constraining matter lately, but I'll still perform a lot of work personally and there'll be other pace limitations. Either way, I hope I can find success because these great ships gleaming 
the pinnacle class symbols of mankind's achievement richly deserve a long and noble second life. Now, as Owen was reading that out, uh, I've played the video. So if you're watching on YouTube, uh, if not, uh, I would uh, recommend that you do because the, the, the photos and everything are amazing. And I, I recommend that you do approach the Daily Star newspaper. If you are an, of a nervous disposition, you approach it with extreme caution. Uh, <laughs> but the pictures are very much worth having a look there. But as I say, if you're watching the YouTube version, uh, you'll see the video uh, played over the top while Owen was talking there. But uh, I don't know. I mean, it, I, you, you could make them very homely i i guess with it with some basic conversion i mean i could quite happily live in the business lounge at the 767 i was on earlier that looked very delightful as i was <laughs> being herded into cattle class down the back <laughs> yes exactly but uh, no i mean i, I think there's, there's lots of um lots of good things you know there aren't there in, in terms of the, the sort of facilities that they might offer uh, yeah but uh, sounds good. Anyway, so the last story then uh, in the commercial news segment is about uh, British Airways. And this is on the chaviation.com website. And they, it's talking about their um, desire to retire all of their 747-400s by the year 2024. And they will be retired through 2022. And the remaining 12 aircraft will leave the carrier's fleet in the following two years. The aging jets will be replaced with a mix of... Uh, of A350 and uh, Boeing 787s. According to Flight Go Global, uh, British Airways CFO Steve Gunning said that the new planes will be 30% more fuel efficient than the 747s and provide 196 uh, US dollar, uh, sorry, million uh, US dollars in savings per annum. The airline is currently the largest operator of 747s uh, globally. British Airways uses the jets most extensively on routes from London Heathrow to New York, uh, Washington, Dulles, uh, Las Vegas, McCarran, and Cape Town, for example, according to the CH Aviation Capacity. No, you, you, pro you pronounced that wrong, Nev. I'm sorry. It's Washington, Dull. It's oh, not, yes, uh, of course yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> silly, silly, silly you. Silly. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the average age of British Airways 747s is 21.2 years old, according to the CH Aviation's fleet module. And all of the 36 jets are at least 18 years old. The airline uses the Boeing 747s in four seating configurations, ranging from 275 to 347 seats in a four-class layout. This year alone, Eva Air, United Airlines and Garada Indonesia have retired their 747-400s, whilst Delta Airlines has scheduled the last flight of a Boeing 747-400 for December the 17th. Um, this was inevitable, I suppose, really, because obviously the, the jets uh, are not, not quite as uh, efficient as, as the current no. stuff. Um, no. But it's interesting as well that BA decided to extend the life of the 747s because I think of, of, of the way that they buy their fuel and, and that kind of things, that the hedging that they do. Um, obviously, the, the aircraft have been paid for years ago, I yeah. would imagine, and therefore it was it's still a, a very popular aircraft, which is why they had all the in yeah. interiors uh, refurbished as well. Yeah, but, very much so. Actually, actually, I, I, I use that as an example actually because I mean, I, I it was uh, they were seven six seven three hundreds, both aircraft that I went out to New York on, and the one that we went out on uh, from Heath throw uh, although it was a seven six seven three hundred a similar age to the one that i came home on but it had a, it, it had a refit so it got a new um in-flight entertainment system it was really fancy you could pick and choose which films you want the one that we came back on was so tired it's just not funny mm. uh, i mean it still had the four by three tiny little barely led screens in the back of the headrest Yes. So I, I am. But do you remember you, when there wasn't any LED screens in the back of the headroom? <laughs> when it was no, I don't screen actually. up at the you know up at the top. Yeah, uh, the, the, the uh, they, they fall down it, and you'd be selecting your your languages with like the catalog of the the film, and you, you have to press like one for English and two for Japanese and three yeah. for French. I ended up seeing. The whole of the Harry Potter, the second Harry Potter, lovely, um, in Japanese because I couldn't figure out how to work out the language. <laughs> okay, right, okay. Did it make any sense? You know, I mean, I know you've got a, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. An yeah. Understanding, you know, you, you've got an advantage over, say, me sat in that position because I've got no hope. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, I could understand a, a fair bit, but yeah. uh, but that, that, that's yeah, when they had those uh, cathode ray tube projectors uh, mounted on the ceiling and, and the pull down screen, and it was mm. all four by three, as you say, and it was all, all a bit. Uh, yeah. Mind you, I suppose, uh, I mean, then you know, at least they had something to, to watch because before that there was very little. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Lane's actually saying, "Oh, uh, too bad." I thought Matt was going to get the seven six seven four hundred. Was it a seven six seven four hundred? Perhaps it was. Uh, what well, uh, on? Did you fly United? It prob- yeah, it probably was then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's just me being a muppet. I'm afraid, Lane. I'm not very good at this whole <laughs> <laughs> aircraft thing. Yeah, uh, we don't really do planes on this. Ship. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not very good at it now. So. No, no, yeah. yeah. Look, I, look. Hey, look. I got on one and went all the way to New York and back, having only done the thing. So well, that's actually, enough the, for me. The, the thing we haven't spoken about really is uh, you've not mentioned once anything about your fear of flying. Or, or anything so that's for, for me that that tells me that uh, you know things have improved a great deal for you like you wouldn't believe as i say and as, I, as i alluded to at the top of the show i mean the the the, the i the mere thought of me successfully falling asleep on an airplane is mm. is like not something i never thought i'd do and i but i yeah it, i i honestly wasn't worried at all i yeah. i it just sort of and I, I do think the bigger aircraft makes a huge difference as well. It doesn't yeah. feel quite so vulnerable, perhaps, as the smaller ones. But it's, um, yeah. I was just saying, Lane's saying that the 400s are very rare. They're only 37 built. Most of them probably bought by United, I would guess. Uh, <laughs> mm, Delta fly them as well uh, from Heathrow to Atlanta, I think. And, but, uh, uh, yeah, no, a, a very very pleasant flight, really, in yeah. the end. As I say, it's just uh, I, we need to do the seat guru, guru thing, I think, before we book our seats next time. Because going out, we were one row from the back, mm. and that was really nice. There was, you know, good, good um, leg room, et cetera. But uh, we were right at the back. Uh, on the way home and I said I couldn't get my knees behind the thing despite having to have an argument with the stewardess who was telling me that the seat pitch was no different um, right at the back than it was one row forward and it wasn't until my my uh, my you know that Sarah actually had a tape measure in her handbag that I was able to actually prove to her that there was a difference oh, between the rows. Oh dear, you didn't cause an incident did you? I, well, I, <laughs> well no because it was obviously different this is what I was, it's just yes. like, I'll be honest with you, this particular member of staff was not a good advert for, and a part of me wishes I'd got her name because she really was that bad that I want to be naming and shaming her. Um, mm, she, yeah. she was not a good advert for United at all. She was very unprofessional with the way that she was dealing. Uh, to, without wanting to go into, there was a, uh, there was a, a few people obviously who were, were, uh, who were Jewish and obviously wanted kosher meals to go mm. with their thing. And yeah. for whatever reason, there'd been a terrible screw up and there was only one kosher meal on board. Um, yeah. So that meant that there, this, this other guy basically had to go without. And she was, she wasn't very good about the way she handled it. I really didn't think that was a professional way uh, to do it. I mean, there must have been a way, even if you were offering them things like fruit or something like that, you know, as a way of sort of, so that the poor guy wasn't sat there starving to death by the yeah. time he yeah. got to the other end. So uh, she, she just wasn't a very good example of, uh, of how to handle customer service, frankly. Um, so yeah, I perhaps should have got a name named ashamed her but um, that was more the reason why i was being unusually difficult with her because she was you know she i I don't mind being i'm happy to be proved wrong but when you can when you're literally standing right by the row and uh you know and i said do you want me to prove it to you and she went no so i proved it anyway um (laughs) just because you know i thought i don't like being lied to you know so she obviously knew there was a difference she was just trying to sort of you know make me stop it but yes. uh, yeah. you know, there we are. So I, I won in the end, and it's great. I got a, I got a free upgrade to to um, much to Charlotte and uh, <laughs> Sarah's annoyance. I got an upgrade to uh, uh, premium economy. Which oh, so so they didn't then? No, they didn't. Oh, they, they stayed where they were. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Wow. So, I know. Well, it was it was it was Charlotte that started it because I literally tried to get my knees in there. I mean, if the guy in front had like reclined his seat, I I don't know what would happen because mm, yeah. I'd have break, broken my legs and that. So it was sort of Charlotte that started it, and anybody who's had the pleasure of meeting Charlotte knows that she's not a lady to be messed with. Mm, um, no, 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 no. If you've got any sense, you do as you're told. When Charlotte, yes. uh, yeah. So, oh yeah, definitely, definitely. But we had a good time in New York, didn't we, mate? 
We did. We really did. Yeah. We had an excellent time. We went did lots of touristy things. We we did, yeah, Statue of Liberty and all sorts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's anything. We, we, we even went saw a couple of cheeky shows on Broadway, didn't we? Yeah. Oh, nice. I, yeah. I, I saw a few. Yeah. You, in fact, you saw more than me, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, because I, I went uh, one of the nights just before you arrived as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so you, you went and saw, was it the Book of Norman? The Book of Norman, I saw oh, um, Waitress, and yep. we saw Miss Saigon. Miss Saigon, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so we so were right, rather enjoying the fact that we were in Broadway. That, and I'll tell you what, if, any, if, if, if anybody has never been to Times Square and you get the opportunity to go to Times Square at night, oh, Nev, it was marvellous. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was tech-tastic, huh? It was tech-tastic. That is a great way of describing it. Those... those High revolution resolution screens were just. Uh, that, uh, although there is, I did manage to take a very nice video of one that, ironically, uh, was up there by Microsoft, and and it had several pixels missing, uh, oh. so I I couldn't resist. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of the commercial news segment for this week. And although, um, if you if you would, I would like to read out something that has just come through about a three or four hours ago uh, regarding the Dubai Air Show. Yeah, please do. Um, so this is from the BBC News forward slash, uh, bbc.co.uk forward slash news forward slash business. And it says Dubai Air Show Boeing wins, fi wins $15 billion order from Emirates. Uh, so Boeing kicked off the first day of the Dubai Air Show by announcing the first big sales news of the five-day event. Emirates has ordered 40 Boeing 787 Dreamliners in a deal worth about $15 billion oh. or about $11.3 billion at list prices. Um, the so Dubai right, Airlines chairman... That's yeah. Contrary to the story we read a moment ago, where they were talking about getting... Or was that Qantas? Well, no, that... they, no, this, no the, it was Emirates again. But the funny thing is that... Um, Neither Emirates nor Airbus would comment on the status of the rumoured A380 order, which would help product, uh, protect jobs the aircraft manufacturers plant in North Wales, where the wings are made. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, so it's looking like the Airbus deal is still not off the table. But uh, yeah, uh, Emirates going in a slightly different direction uh, than the, uh, the the sort of two uh type aircraft uh or two type yeah two type air, two aircraft type airline model uh mm -hmm. that they have had up to uh, well it, for the last four years or so anyway yeah oh. so that's just a bit of news that came out of the dubai it's air show the last couple of hours. yeah very good yeah very good. yeah yeah yeah, interesting, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing more from uh, Carlos uh, when he gets back. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, should be fantastic. Right. Sorry so, about the interruption. <laughs> not at all. Uh, all interruptions are greatly received. Yeah. Um, Especially when they're aviation related. That's, oh, that's yeah. always a winner. Yeah. <laughs> Completely, yeah. Oh, um, you're dense. That's fine. Well, um, we uh, don't have a military news segment this week, sadly, but we are going to play another one of my passenger experience segments. Well, this week I'm speaking with someone with whom I actually work. Andrew Wilson, or AJ as everyone calls him, was in the Royal Air Force in the UK for over 20 years and was posted on overseas operations on many occasions. AJ wasn't in flight operations per se, but he was involved in a lot of stuff that he's probably not allowed to talk about, or he'd probably have to kill me. <laughs> he's been on many forms of crew transport over the years, so I thought I'd speak with him about some of those experiences. I began by asking him about the kind of aircraft that he had flown on during his military career. Uh, well, I joined the military in 1990, way back, way back then, um, and I guess my first experience of military flying was probably when I was posted out to Cyprus and that was uh, on a TriStar 
uh, flying out there from the uh, the murky murkiness of uh, Peterhead out to the 44 degrees on the pan at Akrotiri. Oh, nice. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was the first time, and then it was a back and forward process from Cyprus to the UK. Whenever I had to go on a course, or whether I was coming home on leave, or something like that. Now, what sort of other aircraft do, do the military operate for for mass um, transport like this? So at that time, that was the TriStar and the VC10. They were the two sort of choice aircraft going out, but obviously you had the C-130s as well for getting out uh, army guys out to areas of operations. Um, and now, obviously, the uh, the primary one is the, the Voyager, which I've not actually had the, the privilege of going on. Now, what's it like being on this sort of transport? You know, the, the, are they serving you the, the caviar and, and the champagne and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, obviously, uh, me being in the RAF, uh, well, we normally used to a higher standard of life than <laughs> the, uh, the boys in green and blue. Uh, but no, it wasn't. It was definitely a, 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 a no-frills airline. If you think that... Uh, uh, Things like Ryanair and uh, EasyJet are at no frills. Sorry, you've not experienced it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And um, I think t- today it's quite interesting because obviously the, the, the older aircraft must be very expensive to operate, which is why the RF have retired uh, so much of the, the older stuff. Um, but I would imagine that the Voyager must be quite a, um, because it's very modern aircraft, might be quite reasonable inside as well. I've not been in one myself, but people that have been in them tell me that they're, they're rather nice. Yeah, I, and certainly the, the, my friends that have been on them have said that uh, the uh, the experience of that is much like uh, much akin to flying on a uh, on a British Airways aircraft. You know, it's same same standards of seats. Um, it's just it's RAF personnel that are serving you, um, and they they still serve you a meal. It may be in a cardboard box uh, as it's just come out of the the mess at Bryce Norton or whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's very much like a civilian aircraft, not like uh, some of the other ones that they operate. So. Mm. Right, going back to uh, what I would call normal commercial flying now. Um, now you do a bit of flying backwards and forwards to places in Europe for, for work sometimes and that kind of thing. Um, what about when you're flying yourself, um, when you're going on holidays with your wife and that kind of thing? Wh- wh- who do you sort of choose? For I, I guess it sort of probably ends up being the, um, the, the package holiday idea. I'll, I'll go with um, Thompson. I'll never, ever fly with Thomas Cook again. Uh, I've had uh, plenty of bad experiences with that, whether it's the holiday itself or, or the flights. Yeah, um, now don't, don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, AJ, t- tell us a little bit about what what happened to you. Oh, just um, well, certainly when we went out with Thomas Cook, uh, I I know it wasn't their fault, but uh, certainly the um, it smelled like a sewer on the way back because I think the whole plane had gone down with something. Um, the the staff were were shockingly bad. Um, and yeah, I just just an all round bad experience. I think. I think, and it, also again, I think they are trying to wedge as many people into the seats as possible. And when you're six foot three, uh, that hurts. It's all right for my wife because she's only five foot five foot two and a half. So I tend to end up sharing her. Um, legroom space, as they say, without being in the uh, biblical manner. <laughs> but actually, you'd flown with them previously, hadn't you? Uh, and uh, they, they'd done a good job? They they had done a good job, yes. Um, I'd done a, a, a couple of holidays um, across to Cyprus, but then it just seemed that on the last couple of holidays we've had, um, we just had a bad experience. Um, we've changed over to Thompson, and Thompson have been absolutely superb every time. Um, when we have actually booked flights with um, companies like like Virgin, Virgin was very good. I found uh, the uh, trip over to New York to be uh, a really enjoyable one, and especially on the way back, we did pay for extra legroom seats for me. Uh, when I sat down in the seat, it was uh, my knees were up round my ears. Uh, I said to the the girl, and she said, "No, that's that's fine. Um, I can move you to another seat." So we didn't get upgraded, but we got a a better seat. So yeah. that was quite good. Well, tonight we're having dinner with Captain Al, who uh, obviously is a senior captain, but no longer with Monarch Airlines. Sadly, after the demise of the airline yep. a few weeks ago, um, did you ever fly on Monarch at all? Um, I think I've been out with Monarch uh, twice. Again, I think that was that was on a package holiday 
so uh, you know i don't i don't tend to to pay for a flight and then work out when i'm going to stay um i just like to just do one payment and that's it all done so maybe that's that's the de- the demise of my holidays really so. yeah now what about the long haul stuff that you did over to thailand who who do you fly with oh um, when we flew over to there we went over with thai air and that was that was quite nice um again i think i think my main gripe comes from the fact that, that i'm i'm a little bit longer on the leg than some people and it is quite tight on a, on a long haul flight to there it was it was uncomfortable i didn't get much sleep yeah but um it's it's not the worst flight i've been on obviously now if obviously we're, we're trying to get you know good value for money with our flying and that kind of thing do you think that premium economy really plays an important part in people's decision making when it comes to this sort of stuff I, I think so, yeah, and I, but I think that the um, the premium economy um, uh, suggests it's more than what it is. I think sometimes um, when you look at what you get for that that extra money, and sometimes it's it is a, a fair amount more. It's it's double the price of the of the standard ticket. You th- I being quite materialistic, probably I think, and my wife would say, um, would rather spend that money on something else. So I'll sit and suffer and grape about it later. So, yeah, yeah, so you'd prefer to spend your money <laughs> somewhere else, basically, wouldn't you? Something on like a, an Apple device or something yeah. on that. So yeah. where's the next sort of destination for you then, in terms uh, of holidays? Well, and that funnily kind of enough, it's not actually um, flying. We're uh, we're doing a, a drive, so we're driving to Italy, and we're going through all the countries on the way. So we're gonna, I think we're going to do France, uh, Germany. Um, and then head into Switzerland, and then we're going to stop off. Apparently, we have to stop off in Milan for a bit of shopping for my wife. <laughs> so yes, I'm uh, trying to get a mortgage before we go. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that's that's the next one. But the next flight-wise, I don't know. I think it's probably going to be ISE. Yeah, so that's our big uh, show that we do. Uh, well, well, we visit every year in Amsterdam, and uh, the number of flights between. Heathrow, for example, in Amsterdam is extraordinary. Um, there's so many, but of course, there's a new train service as, as yeah. well. You're going to give that a try? Oh, I might, I might actually give that a try, actually, because I, I, I quite fancy the idea of uh, one of the things with air travel that, that that kind of gets me is is the fact that you you're there two hours before you've got to you know check through it's the whole process of the checking in and getting the and you never quite relax until you get on the plane and then of course you've got the the, the other side and having traveled on the the Eurostar before I found it quite a pleasurable experience so I thought why not make that journey to ISA no, that might be quite good yeah mm. so, so that's what gonna be four hours yeah roughly, I think it's about it? four hours four more or potentially four and a half mm. but that's that's time you know you can justify sitting there with a with a glass of wine and maybe have your laptop open and um, and do some do a little bit of work before you get there and yeah. just to give you time off when you're in Amsterdam and of course that that newer runway in Schiphol as well you land on that you've still got another 25 well, minutes yeah, of taxiing before you get to the terminal you're basically <laughs> landed in Germany yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> feels like it doesn't it but uh, anyway it's great AJ great to speak to you thanks very much indeed no problem thanks Find this and other great shows at the Aviation Media Network. The Voices in Your Head dot com. The Plane Talking UK podcast is a voluntary project that aims to keep you informed with the latest aviation related stories from news buyers across the globe. Producing our content does cost money though. If you enjoy our show, why not help us keep on the air by making a donation towards the server and website hosting fees through PayPal? Any contributions would be greatly appreciated. Are you an Amazon user? If so, why not do your shopping through the link on our website? There's no cost to yourself and Amazon pay us a small referral fee on qualifying purchases. To find out more about the show and to meet the team, take yourself to our website website www.plaintalkinguk.com or find us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash plain talking uk on twitter via at plain talking uk or get in touch via email on podcast at plain talking thanks, thanks for, for listening, listening. flyby 5823 trent dane for two three hour manchester with air 6x client flight level 210 direct to britman's park United 123, maintain 280 knots.
That's enough air traffic control for today, Nat. Bedtime. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to fly a commercial passenger jet? Looked up at the sky and thought, I wish that was me? Well, now anyone has the chance to have a go at flying in a real aircraft simulator. NP Simulations and Flight Experience London, the only official Boeing licensed product of its kind in the UK, offer you the chance to fly anywhere in the world in their fixed base Boeing 737-800 Flight Simulator. And that's not all. Ground School London offers many different courses for the up-and-coming pilot looking for a start in aviation. With prices starting at just £109, the sky's the limit. So for the ultimate flight simulator experience or engaging preparatory courses, including those for schools and colleges, check Check out the websites at www.london.flightexperience.co.uk and www.groundschoollondon.com or call on 020 300 40 616. NP Simulations. Fly your dreams. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, it was great talking with, with AJ. As I say, I, I work with him and uh, he, he's a good laugh and uh, he's got some fantastic experiences. I might do a part two of that one day as well, actually, because he's got a lot more uh, to talk about. I, I bet he has. He sounds like a right character. He really yeah, does. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, anyway, uh, you've got a nice little segment to play in now, uh, Matt, haven't you? I have, yes. So uh, I was very lucky. Obviously, those of you who, who, who follow the show will know that uh, that at the time of recording this, I've literally just got back from New York. Owen, you actually got back from New York. Uh, not yet. You came back Friday, didn't you? Uh, and then, bless you, literally Saturday, arrived. Saturday yes. morning. I, I yes. arrived late Saturday morning and yeah. uh, then went to work. Very, you did literally strong. came home from work and then went went uh, yeah went, went well, straight I, I, to bed. I, no, I went to bed for a long time. Okay, I went straight to bed and then straight to work. <laughs> okay, very good. So uh, so yes, so uh, I was very lucky enough that uh, on the Saturday because uh, we were sport with people to meet up with actually weren't we while mm, we were there because yeah. Captain Nick came and met up with us while we were were there and Dave I got to I, meet up with Captain Nick twice. Wow, get you get it you. Was, oh, it was good. And Dave Abbey was an absolute star. And on the Sunday, he yes, really did give yes. us. Uh, oh, I'll tell you what was nice because because somebody who knows the area, you got a real, you got a proper tour of New York, not just the touristy shiny bits. Uh, and uh, that raised walkway, which used to be the um, I forgot what they call it. Is it the highway? Um, the High Line. The High Line. That's right. Which used to be an overground sort of above ground railway, but rather than demolish it, they've turned it into a uh, like a like a, a like a walkway with gardens and stuff. And it really is quite beautiful. So if you are in New York, I'd recommend that as a, a good way of killing a couple of hours because it's a lovely, it's a lovely, lovely walk. But uh, on the Saturday, this is just before I came home, we were met uh, up, or I I was met in my hotel lobby by the legend it that is the main man, Michael and him and uh, several other people who uh, you'll be introduced to during this recording took me to a very famous deli in New York. Hi guys, Matt here. I'm still in New York actually, although uh, I think when we're doing the show now we're actually going to, I'm actually going to be back in the UK, but I'm in New York at the moment. We are sitting in the very famous Cat's Deli. Have I said that right? There like they're all nodding at me that's a good sign and uh, we're we're sat here at a table we've now started the food is now starting to arrive um and it's uh Wow, I mean, I, I, I think tradition. I, I say the word diner and probably get told off, but it very much reminds me of a sort of a, a, tr a traditional American diner, and it is, it's got neon signs everywhere, and there's loads of. I presume these are sort of well-known people of, who have frequented the restaurant all on the wall, and it literally goes from one end of the wall, all the way down to the other. It is just incredible. We've just had our knishes arrive, and we've had. Um, I know I'm going to get told off for this because we always get told off for talking about food on the show. But uh, <laughs> we've had, um, well, I call them gherkins, but what, what do we call them here? A full sour pickle, as okay. well as a pickled green tomato. Okay, all right, here comes the rest. All right. So, yeah, sorry about that. The uh, food has just arrived, and I have sat in front of me a, a pastrami on rye sandwich. And now I had pastrami when we were in Pittsburgh uh, a few months back. And it didn't look anything like this. This is absolutely incredible. What was what, this? And mustard. Oh, a special mustard. You absolutely have to put mustard on, on the rye bread. Um, Must this pastrami, Katz's Delicatessen dates back, and this is Micah, by the way, your main man, Micah. And I insisted, 
with my friend Eric, who will try to get on the recording a little bit later. When we had pastrami in Pittsburgh with Matt, Matt said, this is really good pastrami. Eric and I were sitting across from him, and we said, no, it's not. <laughs> we will take you to where there is good pastrami when you come to New York, and this is the place. Katz's has been in business since the late 19th century. I used to come here with my father. I used to come here with my grandfather, and before that, my great-grandfather would come here. It's a tradition. If any of the, uh, the listeners have ever seen the film When Harry Met Sally, in that film, there is a scene when Meg Ryan enjoys herself faking this enjoyment. And that takes place in this restaurant. And in fact, if Matt looks to his right right now, he'll see hanging up from the sign, the table where that scene was filmed. It's a very, very famous place. I'd like to think that perhaps it wasn't quite so busy in here as it, uh, then when they were filming it as it is now. I should say, it's absolutely heaving. I mean, when we arrived here, the, the, the queue was like halfway down the sidewalk, wasn't it? I mean, it was um, just, just, it's obviously a very popular place and I can see why. So um, yeah, we're gonna tuck into our sandwich. We'll be back after this. So dinner has now been officially consumed. I have to say that is, I've never any, eaten anything quite so tender. But we're not going to talk about the food because otherwise, once again, I shall get told off by our wonderful chat room listeners. But uh, there we are. <laughs> I think we can talk about food just a little bit only because we're recording this in Katz's Deli. And we should explain because you had some very, very unique things that you typically would not find worldwide or really actually any place else but in New York City. Well, well, that is true, and it was amazing, as I say. So if you do ever find yourself in New York City, and you can be patient, because seriously, the, the line to get in here seems to start very early, and it's still like halfway down to, sort of, I think, like three blocks down even now. Um, but it is absolutely delicious. It is Cat's Diner, and it is um, delicatessen, my apologies. Cat's Delicatessen, and it's amazing. But, uh, yeah, we're just going to quickly uh, talk about who's joined me for dinner. Obviously, Michael, you've already... Uh, uh, heard from so uh, sitting next to Micah is our host if you like gave us a wonderful tour on Sunday of New York City that's where we were went to the marathon uh, and all that kind of thing and I think uh, and uh, certainly Owen's host for a couple of days because he arrived here just beforehand so uh, welcome David oh thank you Matt thank you Matt it's great to be here and uh, Micah thanks for organizing this Mi Micah coordinated this today and there's about seven of us here having a great great meal and Matt, I'm glad you had a successful trip in New York and ending it on a very fulfilling note of a huge pastrami sandwich. Yeah, perfect way to finish our time here in New York. Yes, although if things go as well as they did do, then me and Charlotte may well be back again sooner rather than we thought. But anyway, that's all about the fun. At least we know where we need to go now. So that's the main thing. We have some other guests and regular chat room uh, members here with us at Katz's Delicatessen. One of them is someone that I have only met for the first time today, but we have been friends with through Twitter and the chat room for, what, about a year now, more or less? And we've been dying to meet because we have the same taste in food, which is scary, the same taste in music, which is even more frightening, but I suppose the most frightening part is the fact that we have the same taste in podcasts and aircraft. It's Tanya Wyman. Hello, everyone. This is Tanya. I'm here with uh, Philip, who I won't uh, put on the spot. Uh, but yeah, I'm just having a lovely time with these very fine gentlemen and now stuffed after having my Dr. Brown celery and uh, my uh, brisket sandwich and split pea soup and just having a, a great old time, delicious food, fantastic company and this is so much fun and so great to meet Main Man Micah for the first time and Matt and Eric. <laughs> and there's another person here with us who uh, some of you have met before or heard of before and that is um, a very close friend of mine, a man that I call my Kreplock brother who accompanied me to Pittsburgh and uh, who we decided when we met Matt in Pittsburgh uh, that we needed to introduce him to True Pastrami and that's my good friend Eric Ryback. Well hello and uh, thrilled to be back at Katz's and thrilled to be with this company and introducing some people to this quintessential New York experience. I've been coming here for 49 years and really, other than it's a lot more crowded, it has not changed. The prices have changed a little bit. In 1968, a pastrami sandwich was 85 cents, and I believe we paid $21.45 today. But, you know, there's nothing like 
it catches pastrami in the world. It's the best. And I do want to do a shout out to the friend who brought me here 49 years ago. His name was Barry Pretzel. I met him in seventh grade. That was his real name. And he just passed away this year. And so for me, this is also the Barry Pretzel Memorial Lunch. I am glad to share it with new friends and old friends. And then also joining us here today is a close friend of Dave Abbey. And Dave, I'll let you introduce Dave Williams. So when Micah said we were going to have this meetup and we could invite a few other people, I said, well, maybe an aviation geek or someone who works in the aviation field would be interested in coming. So my good friend David Williams, who I met actually on a nostalgia train ride a couple of years ago, um, decided to come along. So how was your meal, Dave? And thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me here today. Yeah, I'm happy to meet everybody, and also not that just a nav geek crowd, but a but a train geek crowd as well. So, yeah, my my family goes railroading and aviation go long ways back, and my uh, family, third generation uh, pilot, second generation airline pilot, and um, so yeah. And Dave and I have met also basically via through NYC Aviation, Phil Lerner's organization, and. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing me out to Katz's. I enjoyed meeting everybody. Oh, great, David. I'm glad you could come. And here again is the main man. So, Matt, we've managed to get together. We've still got a few more things to do before we get you back to the hotel, and you can take a, uh, uh, your trip back to EWR and then back to LHR. What were some of the highlights of your trip here to New York City and your first time in New York? Oh, that's a really difficult question because there's so – I think – this is, is going to sound very, very sad, but actually the tech geek in me s is screaming that I think the thing that first blew me away was my first night here actually in New York where we're literally walking out into Times Square and it's just, you know, for a guy who's obsessed by technology to just walk out of that subway station and see all of the big screens and, and everything all lit up. Like, I mean, it was just, just like, it's like... And the definition of these massive screens that are on these buildings is just frightening you know i wish my television at home was that good it was just just great it's um that has been lots of highlights really um i was very unimpressed by the statue of liberty i've got to be honest <laughs> it was a little i don't know i thought she'd be a lot bigger somehow i don't i don't know quite quite why but yeah that was uh that that was one of the days but yeah it just does so many I've, I've never done so much walking as i have done this last few days we went to um uh the marathon and we sort of walked several different places on the marathon this was on the sunday the new york marathon and uh yeah just a just a great experience i'd not actually been um sort of rope side before on a on a marathon and the atmosphere is something that will stay with me forever for everybody standing there literally screaming and cheering on people they don't know and it was just oh just just magical to, to sort of be wrapped up in that atmosphere and uh, we 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 will get got chatting to a young family there whose mother stroke uh, wife stroke uh, uh, daughter were was actually at the ma marathon running it and it was such a lovely moment when she ran up to them and and all that kind of thing and off she went again for another I don't know how many miles it's just brilliant it's um yeah I, sh I shall never forget it it's it's been great but. Yeah, I really, I really do love New York. I really do love New York. But I have to say, as an Englishman in New York, the one thing I'm never going to understand or get my head around is this whole tipping thing. Uh, it's just so alien to, to us Brits. I, I guess it's just, uh, it's, I, I guess here, of course, it's just a way of life. So nobody, nobody, nobody bats an eyelid to it. But um, yeah, it, it's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. Anyway, back to Matt in the studio. So thank you, Matt. <laughs> well that sounded like a, a great uh, a great time you had there and uh, i'm uh, very envious indeed oh it's been brilliant it was it really was such a lovely lovely time and it's just like i'll tell you what the one thing that did take me by surprise and i think you experienced this as well didn't you owen it's like when you first arrived it was really very mild and, and warm and you know it was almost shorts and t-shirt weather like on the day that you arrived but it's the like 30... 25 26 degrees it was... I, and, I swear, Wait, like the that's the same as it is in Tenerife now. Yeah, and then we got to the Thursday, uh, and it was the last. Day, it was it was the first day of the of our of the, of the reason why we were there, which was for work. And we'd just come out of the Javis Centre, and we were standing outside there waiting for a taxi. And I've never felt an icy blow like it. It was just, talk about 
plummet in temperature. And like in under a week, it had gone from 24, 25 degrees down to what felt like minus five. I mean, it was just so cold. Just yeah, yeah, it really was. It is. Uh, it, it, is. Was, it was zero at about two o'clock in, um, in the afternoon when really? I was just getting into the airport. So that, I've been from 25, 26 to zero in... Well, wow. just under 10 days. Just, yeah, that's just crazy. Yeah, a bit of a shock to the system, isn't it? Yeah. It is very much. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's where we uh, bring uh, to a close this rather unusual episode of yes, uh, the Plain Talking UK uh, podcast, episode 190. I'd like to thank uh, Matt and Owen very much indeed for putting this all together at uh, quite late notice as well and bearing in mind they're both very tired as well so uh. well it had to be done you see because we do have this is the thing we can't just miss one out you see because of a certain 200th that is looming so something has to be released now until, yes, yeah, until, yeah. until that magic number appears but uh, no uh, thank no it's been, been our pleasure Nev. thanks very much for, uh, yeah, thanks, for helping us get one out that's great. And of course, the 200th episode is not that far away either. So oh, no, literally it, 10 episodes away. That's, it, that's it, really scary. It'll, it'll be honest in, in no time whatsoever. But uh, I know, I know. Uh, anyway, thanks, gents, for your contributions today and uh, look forward to seeing everybody next week. Hopefully, um, are, are we going to do a show on Friday? Is that, 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 that the plan? We can get it. Uh, yeah, together? I think I think that's the plan. Hopefully normal service will be resumed yeah. next week. We'll have we'll have the we'll have the legend that is Carlos back in the chair, busy taking control as always. We can all relax and just just like go back to our normal jobs of what we normally do on the show that'll be nice i'm sure he's going to have a lot to say for himself oh, and, and that's that's no uh, yeah no bad thing because he's, he's been on a great uh, great trip hasn't it so he yeah, has it can't right. wait i'm seriously looking forward to that footage it's, we've got some great interviews to look forward to i know so mm, yeah Definitely. brilliant really good anyway folks thanks very much indeed for tuning in once again and uh look forward to speaking to you again later in the week bye yeah, for now so- Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.